It's the How to Write Funny podcast. My name is Scott Tickers, and today I'm speaking with Andy Borowitz, creator of The Borowitz Report. You are one of the most successful prose comedy writers that I know. It's, it's a small field. People who actually make any money writing comedy, like on the page. Um, how did that happen? Uh, well, I, well, thank you for saying that. But, it, you know, actually, as you described that, uh, it reminds me a little bit of that thing in, in Bull Durham, the movie, the, the movie about Kevin Costner as a minor, le- minor league player. And there's something almost about, like, being the most, the, the longest-running minor league player in history. So many people have fled prose comedy because it's, there's this perception that there's so much more money writing for TV or exactly. movies. And there is. It's a stepping stone. Um, exactly. So... Um, and, you know, back in the day, I mean, before you and I got into this stuff, in the, in the 1930s and 40s, you'd be a prose humorist in New York, like Dorothy Parker or Robert Benchley, and then you'd immediately sell out and go to Hollywood and make all the big money. I kind of took a, the opposite path, which yeah. is I got out of college. I was writing prose uh, for the Lampoon, for the Harvard Lampoon, and you know, really doing kind of the same thing that I do now. I mean, we would do uh, we would do parodies of the Harvard Crimson, which was the very serious kind of left-wing MSNBC newspaper at Harvard. Did you do a separate uh, yes. newsprint issue? Yeah, I mean, this was really, I, I would say the Lampoon as a magazine, we did five magazines a year, and the Lampoon magazine, at least under my um, editorial uh Supervision was you a were pretty, the president. I was president. Okay, it was a pretty. The Lampoon magazine was pretty forgettable. I mean, it was not like National Lampoon was, which was such a solid kind of legendary product. The Harvard Lampoon was the work of drunk or hungover and extremely lazy um, Harvard students. We were really we were hanging out at this. We had this great. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the Lampoon Castle. But I have been this to the castle. Very cool. Flemish, mock Flemish castle Super in Cambridge. And it's like, you're giving 18-year-old kids a chance to drink, watch cartoons, and hang out in a Flemish castle all day. How much writing do you think that these people will actually do? Pretty much none. And so the actual Lampoon magazine was kind of um, crappy. I mean, I guess I, if I want to really not split hairs, I'd have to say that. And it's all, it, Though it's always felt whimsical and almost like a, a big rough draft yes. from several people who ha- had to write something. Exactly. Uh, but there, there's yeah. some magic in that because the, the people are very smart and yeah. it, it does feel very free and uh, you know, well, just I, unrestrained. Yeah, I mean, I think also the, you know, to, to give it its due, what we really enjoyed about it was half the time we were just cracking each other up. We had things, there were people who were funny and we were doing things that were funny to each other or really just to ourselves. And the rest of Harvard would look at this magazine and say, like, what is this shit? Like, nobody, it was, it was notorious for being um, not entertaining to the rest of the campus. But we never even saw them as our audience. I don't think we thought about who our audience was. That's one of the beauties of being in college. So you were doing this for the pure joy of uh, cracking each other up or just cracking yourself up. But that, that was the magazine. It's almost like art. It, it is almost <laughs> like art. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? Well, it's, it was, you know, what was uh, cool is, and I see this, I have a five-year-old who's now starting to make up stories. Um, every bit as sophisticated <laughs> as what I do. But she's, she's really into heavy make-believe, and you realize that comedy and art, it's all just play. It's very childlike at its best. You are just at that five-year-old level of just making shit up and in, and entertaining yourself. And, and when you hang out with a kid who's five, you realize just how powerful a force that is in the human experience. Yeah. yeah. The, the importance of play and imagination. It's like yeah. They they don't even know the difference between imaginary. And it's real. pretty seamless, and, and it's when very you're powerful. In college, right. you're kind of on that cusp. <laughs> yeah, and aided, aided by alcohol and drugs to of help course. return you to that infantile state. And just enough intelligence to right. <laughs> maybe make something that's entertaining. Right. So yeah, so that was the the magazine was this sort of hodgepodge of some inspired, some ridiculous, and, and some just flat out um, incoherent writing that we would cook up. But, but and, outside Harvard, it's respected and it's seen as a stepping stone to Hollywood yeah. by the time you're there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We, you know, we, can, we can talk about that. Um, you know, when I was there, 
it was at a very, we were a very transitional phase. What, because what year are we talking about? I graduated in 1980. Okay. And when I was there, I would say the, the Lampoon was still populated mainly by kids like me who were sort of children of professional class, parents, doctors, lawyers, who had sent their kids to college, to Harvard, especially thinking that they would also produce the next generation of MBAs. Um, I think you know something like 40% of my graduating class applied um, or had interviews with Goldman Sachs. That is one investment banking firm. I, at that point, if you had asked me what Goldman Sachs was, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. I was not part of that world, but that was really the atmosphere. It was the beginning of the 80s, and uh, we, none of us really who were on the Lampoon were thinking, oh, and then this is going to be the first step in our inexorable rise to becoming Hollywood moguls. We were just thinking, this is going to be a really fun way to spend a couple years of college. Sidetrack. Exactly. And it's like before the real, for our real lives begin, right. when we're lawyers and doctors. Uh, I mean, the other difference of 35 years ago, which it is now, is that Back then, being a doctor or a lawyer was like a slam dunk profession. <laughs> it was like, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, if I, you know, I guess if you know my dreams don't pan out, I can always make a lot of money as a doctor or lawyer. And now everything's been turned on its head. Those yeah. are some of the riskiest things you can go into. But I remember that um, the turning point for me was, uh, and a lot of Lampoon people will agree with this, that um, this guy, rather well known in the comedy world, Jim Downey. Um, who was, I think, class of 1974, had um, gone on to be a writer for Saturday Night Live, which, when I was in college, was just starting. I mean, the, the first season was like 75, 76, mm -hmm. um, which was actually my senior year of high school. So, I mean, I, I, that was when I, when I got into, the, into college. And the idea that there was a kid just a few years older than us who was living in New York and making as much money as a doctor or a lawyer, but to actually do something fun. Like to, there was a way to extend this experience of what we saw as just like staying up all night and having fun and cooking shit up. I mean, that just seemed like an incredible fantasy. And uh, we, you know, I think for me, it was like really a, like a whole world was opening up because I realized, oh, wait a minute. So I could actually spend the next 50 years of my life doing something fun instead so, of something I hated, you know. So before Harvard, when you're in high school, you have like high school buddies and you're kind of into comedy mm -hmm. and you're kind of taking it seriously at that point. So when you get to Harvard and you're at the Lampoon, it seems like maybe you're not quite like the others where they're just like having a good laugh for a couple of years before they get serious. You, you maybe appreciated it more for what it was. Well, you know, I remember in my fresh, in your freshman year, Facebook, before there was Facebook, and there was an actual Facebook at Harvard where you would look at the other kids in your freshman class. I remember I had written down, they asked like what your field of concentration would be, what your major would be, and I had actually written creative writing. So I, I actually did see myself as kind of, I had the sort of these art, artistic pretensions or ambitions. Um, but again, it was like such, it was at odds with how I was being brought up because my, my dad was a lawyer and really the list of acceptable occupations that my parents had prepared for me had one thing on it. It was just lawyer. Right. There was no number two. I so mean, you I, maybe hadn't consciously reckoned that. No, I was real I was very conflicted. I mean I was sort of think everything, you know, everything that I was doing sort of indicated that I wanted to be in the arts in some way. I was doing theater. I was um acting and singing. Um acting really terribly I should add, but still acting. I was writing, you know, plays. We were doing comedy reviews. I was spending all my time at the Lampoon, and then very marginally focusing on schoolwork with the idea that I would apply to law school. Did you so, do Hasty Pudding? I did Hasty. P I wrote the Pudding Show one year. I um, I put on all kinds of musicals. I mean, I'm not even a musical person, but I just was like, I was so eager to do anything, uh -huh. uh, in. In, not, not in show business, but just in putting on a show. I really loved, I loved the fun of hanging out with other people who were interested in comedy. And, and I was doing a little bit of stand-up too, not, not as much um, as I got into later, but I mean, I, I just, I was a real ham. That's um, early for stand-up. Yeah. Late yeah. 70s. It was, the real boom hadn't started yet. Right. But I mean, it's actually, it's... Where did you even do that? Like at uh, 
coffee shops or? yeah i mean and also like to me it was it was mainly in my in my role as the president of the lampoon i would often have to kind of preside over events we didn't actually it's how i got my first job because we were hosting this night um with this uh film director named bud yorkin who was norman lear's partner and they did all in the family together and all those 70s shows that came out of that and he, Bud, was trying to jumpstart his um, film directing career. He had started as a film director and then gotten away from it. And he had directed a movie called Start the Revolution Without Me with Gene Wilder and Donald Southern was like a spoof of the French Revolution. It was very kind of a Mel Brooksy kind of film. And so we hosted this uh, night at Harvard where we showed the film and we um, gave Bud a tremendously bogus award, which the Lampoon was very good at doing. And uh, and I had to introduce him, and I just kind of winged this introduction that was pretty disparaging of him, but um, but he thought was funny, and so he just he offered me a job that night. So wow. it was like, so it was actually I kind of performed my way into my first job. I sort of talked my way into my first job. It wasn't I didn't submit any writing to anybody, which is probably just as well. Are you a senior at this point? I was a senior. And so it, what was the job? Well, the job I think was. I would describe it as um, I was his Harvard hood ornament. I was not, I, there was no job, <laughs> there was no job um, uh, description at all. It was like I was going to move out to LA and I was going to sit in the office and try to come up with stuff. And That's pretty sweet. Unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And the, and the most amazing thing about it for me was that if I had not, if somebody had not offered me a job like that, I was so timid and so not a risk taker. Um, I would have applied to law school, or I would have applied to like get a fellowship to delay it for a couple of years and then applied to law school. And you probably didn't even have the wherewithal to t direct your ambition toward entertainment at that mm -hmm. point either. No, because what my parents said to me, and you know, I understand now that I'm a parent, I can relate to wanting to protect your children from failure and and risk and. And in my, in my parents' case, I think there was also a huge element of trying to prevent me from becoming a drain on their finances for the next, you know, 20 years. Uh, but I remember my mom saying to me that being an entertainment lawyer was just like being in entertainment, that it was absolutely, and, sh and she knew that I was like a ham, so she said, it's like being an actor, you get to present your case to the jury. So they're trying to twist, every twist it back to <laughs> law in yes, some way. Every possible way, and, and, then, and even after I got this, as you would point out, like an incredible, sweet job offer, their response was, um, well, you know, you can go out to LA and try that whole thing, but you know we're not going to give you a cent until you you know come to your senses and go to law school. So it was like I had this kind of scimitar hanging over me, um, which was that man, I got to make this shit work because if I don't, I'm going to law school. And I'd actually worked for a couple summers for my dad's law firm, and I knew it was like being Bartleby the Scrivener. I was so miserable and depressed. I knew that that was what I was looking at. I just right. was not. I'm not saying that there aren't happy lawyers out there. I've never met one. There may be. They, they always tell me they're miserable. They're always, yeah, the worst, most, and this sweet people who become depressive and yep. terrible. It's a, it's a really, it's I think it's the worst job. <laughs> it's awful. Um, but uh, I, that's what I would have, would have become, because I do not, I was not an audacious person. You know, it's like I've met, you know, I've met people like, you know, Jimmy Fallon, who, you know, Jimmy Fallon has like so much confidence and like I asked him I said what how did your parents feel about your going into comedy and he was like they loved it <laughs> I was like oh, okay well so you take somebody who's got like tremendous talent like him and also tremendous confidence but also then emotional support you, uh, no wonder you know wonder yeah unstoppable but I had nothing but I was riding the brakes constantly because yeah. I was always afraid that I what my plans were doomed so that's a turning point for you then with that job offer because then perhaps you're conscious of the why and the road for you. Yeah. And you clearly make the jump down the way that you want to go, the Hollywood right. route. Right. And what happens? Well, it was interesting because I, and, and it's, it's a little bit of a study in the changing tastes in comedy and how comedy, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag time between what you might think is funny and what the rest of the country thinks is funny. Because I was coming out of the Lampoon and at that time, um, 
Animal House was still kind of fresh in people's memory, and that was written by some Harvard Lampoon people. I mean, Doug Kenny, Doug Kenny. and then and uh, and then yeah, Harold Ramis, who was Second City, so right, this not related. Yeah. You know, that also became kind of all in the family because all the Second City guys, like Bill Murray and Ramis, they all did um, stuff with the National Lampoon, like right. the stage shows, like so Lemmings. A lot of synergy. It sure was, too. and I mean, in a way, the National Lampoon and Second those Second City people kind of put together shows on New York stages like Lemmings, which then Lauren Michaels, yeah, they sort you know, of, <laughs> said, oh, that looks like a good idea. And so Lauren, exactly. Lauren was the one who really figured out how to make that work. Yeah. But I remember having a meeting, uh, in, it was 1980, was my, one of my first meetings, uh, and I was working for um, Bud Yorkin, and Bud was part of this huge TV empire because he and Norman Lear, although they were not still making new TV shows together, they owned about five or six shows that were ongoing, like The Jeffersons, yeah, and One huge. Day at a Time, The yeah. Facts of Life, and, and Different Strokes. And yeah. there were all these sort of four-camera, taped uh, sitcoms that were huge hits, all of them. Massively Archie successful. Bunker's Place. Um, and I had a meeting with this guy who's actually very famous because he wound up having a great career as a studio head, and he's still running Disney, this guy Alan Horn. And Alan went on to have this amazing career, he ran Castle Rock and they did Seinfeld and then mm. he did was the chairman of Warner Brothers. So he's he's just an amazing had an amazing run. But Alan was a Harvard MBA. And so it was an interesting meeting because it was me, this this twenty two year old Harvard kid, just graduated, talking to a Harvard MBA who was running sort of the business guy behind Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin's company. And he said, you know, this whole Harvard Lampoon sensibility does not work on television. And he gave us an example of the fact that there had been a TV spinoff of Animal House called Delta House, which was that. on ABC, I think, and it lasted about four episodes. <laughs> right. Little wonder, because you can't take an R-rated comedy. Now you can because you have cable and you can do anything on, on, on HBO. But like in those days, when you still had three networks, there wasn't even a Fox yet. You couldn't take the sensibility of Animal House and in any way translate it to a show that would first of all be as funny and secondly appeal to the 30 million people you needed to stay on the air back then it right. was just a very different marketplace yeah incredibly competitive but he was more right than he knew i mean he, he was, was he was talking about animal house which was so much more sophisticated and structured right and calculated to appeal to an audience than the Harvard Lampoon was. The right. Harvard Lampoon was just <laughs> off on cloud nine. Yeah, we were like but Dada. He, to him, they were the kind of the same. Right. Yeah, well, you're right, and that that that's that's a key point because that was the the, the beginning of my experience of network executives or studio executives conflating <laughs> many widely different things and lumping them into one category. Right. Uh, but my what this meant was the first few years that I was out in Hollywood, I was kind of being. Um, the jobs that I had were very much these kind of four camera sitcoms that I actually, in my private life, despised. Like, I mean, the, and of course, the most, we all did. And the most, to me, the, the signature example of this was in one of my early years, was I was assigned to write for The Facts of Life. And I told a story actually at, at The Moth years ago about this, um, where I was, you know, I was really by my own definition the worst writer that the facts of life ever hired because in order Which to is not saying a lot it is not but you know it's funny there was uh, I, I give myself I give myself some credit for this because the whole year that I, I was on the facts of life and I want to say dismally failing to write a convincing facts of life script um, which was true for so many reasons I don't want to say I don't want to act like I was some artiste who was too good for the facts of life. No, I was I really trying. I, but, you know, there was I'm problem. sure you, you were finding that it, that what Alan Horn was saying, that the Harvard Lampoon doesn't work on TV, you were in the trenches on this show realizing that writing one of these shows is a completely different animal Yes. from anything you'd ever done. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not about jokes or comedy. It's about... No structure and character and like learning lessons and yeah like learning lessons was a big problem for me basic stuff that works on a show like the facts of life right so, right and there was you know i and i was not capable i was i was really i really was bad at it um but it was in a way you know as a twenty, i was 24 25 when i worked on that show and of course i was full of lots of um 
assholic attitudes that you have at that age of like superiority. I, I can do this. And superiority and sure. like, I'm too good for this in some ways. Of course. But I, as I was failing miserably, which is a really interesting combination. Um, but, but, so, but I remember this whole period of, of really the 1980s of working in television and TV seemed to me about 10 years. There was a lag time behind, say, the National Lampoon, Saturday Night Live sensibility and primetime TV sensibility. And to me, the interesting kind of pivot point was around 1989, 1990, and it had a lot to do with the introduction of the Fox network. And I was not, I'm one of the only Harvard Lampoon people who did not at any point work on The Simpsons, but all my friends did. And that was suddenly like, oh, okay, now actually, nine years later, uh, you can actually do things that sort of reflect more of this kind of off-center attitude, People, underground. It was an, like an underground comic in a way. Yeah, you know, it had Matt Groening, Life and Hell. Life, and life and people hell. forget just how seismic The Simpsons was. Yeah. So it wasn't just a new network, a fourth channel. Right. It was a show that was so outrageous right. and offensive and, and also incredibly just a, controversial. Also, even in more basic ways, just like a primetime cartoon, which we hadn't had since the Flintstones. So it was yeah, like it just broke so many yeah. barriers. But it was it was it was seismic. And you're right. It was it was like, okay, finally there's a show in prime time on a network that kind of hits a sensibility that you can accept. Right. And that doesn't feel totally pandering and awful and right. wrong. Right. Well, and I guess what I was doing while all those guys were doing that cool show, I was under contract to NBC and I was still in that world of um, four camera Did you try sitcoms. to get on The Simpsons or what? No, happened? you know, it wasn't, you know, I, you know, I it never even, you know, it's funny, like I had actually, I knew um, Jim Brooks, who was the godfather, and Jim Brooks had actually recruited me to be on the Tracy Ullman show, which was the show that The Simpsons was the spun off on. Yeah. And I, in my infinite wisdom, like I was busy doing some other shite at the time, and I, I um, sort of blew it off, although very politely, although I don't, I don't know how he, I don't think people said no to Jim Brooks that often, so yeah. maybe that was a weird decision on my part. I, I've never regretted... Um, not working on The Simpsons. I've enjoyed it as a viewer tremendously, just like everybody else. But I, um, a key thing in life, I think, is really figuring out what are the things that you, make you happy. And what I found in general about Hollywood, and I was there for 15 years, is that collaborative experience of sitting in a room with other writers and putting together a TV show, which is very much an assembly line process. Because you have some it's treadmill, it's relentless, and even when it was going well, and I had some moments there where you know, you know, I had success, and um, you know, the to me the the turning point. If like you're talking about the why in the road that happened after college, the other why in the road happened in 1990 when I created Fresh Prince because that was like, okay, well now I have a hit show, and um, do I then turn this into? my life as do i be, try to become norman lear and and try to do this for the next 30 years of like you know or now i guess it would be chuck Lorre, you know somebody who has like you know 10 tv shows on the air and i actually really shrank from that option almost immediately i mean my initial reaction was well this show's going to be very successful May, is there something else i can do with my life um, other than the big successful thing, <laughs> that You're sounds a little perverse. Your years. Well, it sounds a little perverse, but I, you know, the fact is, even when I was doing the show and the ratings were getting better and better, and was clear that this was going to be something that was going to go into syndication, and everything, I immediately had this sense that this wasn't what this wasn't the activity, the daily activity that I enjoyed. I didn't, to me, even at its highest form, and I could be this could just be my my particular impression of it. The collaborative experience of Hollywood just represents too many other things that I don't like. It just feels like being in an office. It doesn't feel like being a writer per se. Like I think writing, I still have a very old fashioned, probably narrow view of what writing is. And to me, it's one dude at a desk. It's like my daughter coming up with her make-believe. It's like very much, an, for me, it's an internal thing. And it's, it's very, it's kind of self-indulgent. Sure. And it's, and it's not 
playing well with others. It really isn't. And I, I think I was, I was, I think I was good as a producer. I really liked, I liked actors. And that was you know, your role on Fresh Prince. Yeah, I was a showrunner and created it, wrote episodes, and I. The cast was a wonderful group of people, so talented, and every one of them. And it was so great. The audience, you know, it was such a hot show with its intended audience it was like young people the urban audience and then it kind of became you know more of a mainstream hit over time but initially there was something really exciting about uh you know for me also just culturally like being part of like this hip-hop thing i'm the whitest guy you can imagine you probably and didn't know anything about i that. knew nothing <laughs> i had never heard of fresh prince like you know if yeah. he had one you know grammys he had, yeah he had dj had jazzy jazz prior, yeah. yeah and i mean I remember the guy who ran NBC at the time saying, have you heard of the Fresh Prince? And I said, I've heard of Prince. You know, it's like, that was as far as like... The extent of your musical knowledge. Yeah, and there was like, I, the shorter guy, I've heard of him. But, right. but um, it, was, it was cool in a way. It was, it was exciting to, to learn so much about hip hop, which I, I knew nothing. I mean, I knew the Beastie Boys. That was like, I think my experience of hip hop was the Beastie Boys and the Run DMC Aerosmith video of Walk This Way. And that was kind of it. Maybe yeah, you the throw... The whitest rap. Yeah, the whitest rap. Was. Maybe you throw in Blondie's version of Rapture sure, in there. You sure. Just, you know, as a little to spike the ball. I was in a very integrated high school. My Shaker Heights High School was about 40% um, black. Really? When I, when I but grad, you just yeah. didn't have enough crossover to even know about their music or... You know, rap was not really... In the late 70s, you know, if you think about it, like... It, it was it was still kind of club music and street music. It had not really. I can't think of like big rap hits. I'm sure they exist in the late seventies, but it was still for a very specialized audience. And I mean, you know, we were in the late seventies. Um, I graduated in seventy six. We were kind of at the dawn of disco. Well, you know, disco it was, like, was yeah. It was, it was like say, Donna disco, Summer. You know, yeah, disco uh, rap is I guess in some ways one of the backlashes right. against disco. Right. Corporate music. Right. Um, um, punk and and, and punk hip hop was the white yeah. reaction <laughs> exactly and, and they the all black. came together with the Beastie Boys <laughs> right. um, but um, yeah I mean to me to me it was like Fresh Prince I thought it was it was a cool experience in so many ways and yet I also another, I think the other thing that I took away from it is how hard it is to come up with something that really hits in a mainstream popular way. I don't think I have that sensibility. I think there are people like Steven Spielberg um, who, you know, he has like this mind lock on the, how the rest of us think. You clearly did it with The Fresh Prince, but, but it was, I saw it it as was an more app. calculated. It was like a, a craft and it wasn't your natural instinct. You know, but I also think, to be fair, like I think I have real limitations in this area. I thought it was a real outlier for me. I thought like, Will Smith and I intersected at this kind of perfect moment where what I could bring to the table in terms of finally some lampoon sensibility in terms of like the show was absurd and the characters were absurd and over the top. It was kind of a live action cartoon. Not It was not nowhere near as crazy as The Simpsons, but if you look back at it now, I, it, it, I shudder to think the kids think that Fresh Prince in any way represents what the 90s were like because Fresh Prince was so over the top and the characters were were extreme and and to me like to be able to contribute my sensibility and have it you know have this unbelievable instrument of Will Smith who has just charisma oozing from every inch of him it was like the odds of this ever happening again I thought were really low and I mean I, I stand by that I mean I think like people always are asking me I say but don't you wish you had stayed in Hollywood and and created more like hit shows, and it's like I don't think that would have happened. <laughs> I really don't. Lightning I really, in a bottle. Yeah, I think it was really a lucky moment, and I know what my limitations are, and I think that it was one moment where what I thought was funny, a lot of other people thought was funny on TV. Like I thought that there was like just this. It was a rare moment, and it was also just the packaging of that cast and that incredibly talented sort of megastar, and and I I recognized um, just how rare that is there are some again there are people like chuck Lorre who can kind of he's got it down to an algorithm and he's figured it out i am not that person i just don't i think was very fortunate so yeah, lucky and you made the, the decision that you know this is not what you want to do yeah and that's ultimately what happened is i i came i left la another another thing that sort of weighed in my 
decision making was I just didn't like living in Los Angeles. It just wasn't that did not make me happy either. It's just not my kind of a city. It's too much driving. It's not a place where you can walk the streets and run into anybody you know, and and it doesn't feel like a city. It feels like a gigantic strip mall or suburb, and it just it's it's unattractive to me. I hate to sound too picky, but so many things I didn't like about it. You can't it. walk anywhere. You can't anywhere. walk anywhere. The beach is nice there. The weather yeah. can be good. I mean, um, but in those but, days it was smoggy. It was very smoggy. It was also a very bad time in LA history because we had had um, the LA riots, which were very traumatic for anybody who lived through that and, 92 and 90, 92. And then followed hard upon that was the, the Northridge earthquake in 94 and the OJ Simpson trial, which <laughs> while very entertaining to the rest of the country, kind of, again, it's felt like part act two of the riots it was mm. like okay now we're going to have this other kind of sense that there was this tremendous racial divide in the in the city and that the social fabric was very frayed at best so it seemed like a good time to leave LA it seemed yeah. like a good time so I, I moved back here to New York and I really just completely dropped out for a couple of years and when I did I had no plan it wasn't like okay now begins after the, how many years with the Fresh Prince just, just one. one I did. Year. Okay. I did the first season. Then I was a consultant, okay. and uh, you know, the, to me, I felt like said all I need to say about you know Will and Carlton, and I've <laughs> I've, I've said I've just told every story on this. I'd done twenty five episodes, and um, you know, moved back here, and I didn't have any any plan to. I didn't, didn't have like, okay, now my new act begins. I just literally did nothing. The only thing I did was I spent a lot of time reading and I did read quite a bit. I read a lot of literary biographies and I, I got interested in sort of in the New York, um, New Yorker writers, like people like Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley and James Thurber, many of whom had very sad alcoholic existences. I would say almost all of them. The Algonquin Round Table seemed like the most miserable the most group band. of fucks yeah. in the world. But um, but I was interested in I was it was it was kind of a it was kind of an an anachronistic, um, very archaic look back at like, oh, the, if you weren't like in this world of showbiz and Hollywood and television, it was before television, what what were humor writing careers like? And you know, the the stuff Honestly, from the New Yorker in those days, does not hold up. I mean, it just most is, humor doesn't. It age doesn't. Well, generally. It doesn't. And I know that everything. The moment that I put it out there, it has already peaked <laughs> and is yeah. starting to decay. It's just fact. It's like I actually did a, I did an anthology a, a few years ago. I remember we, you and I, talked about it at the time because I wanted to pick your brain about it of American comedy writing, prose humor writing, and it was. It was challenging to find things from earlier eras that that still were funny, with the exception of Mark Twain, who kind of is this super freak of comedy. Yeah. Like, there's no way to explain. He's like Shakespeare. It's like no way to explain how he was funny so long ago and still is. I mean, it has a lot to do, I think, with just the universality of his vision and his language and his logic. It's just kind of rock solid. And if you go if you go back even further, like Jonathan Swift, it's yeah. the people who could really tap universal themes in human nature hu yeah yeah, human yeah. our flaws yeah that are never going to change yeah at least not for 500 million years <laughs> yeah and all we're doing now is the latest iteration of that it was yeah. all done before it but a lot of yeah a lot of writers will do current events or other things that are very ephemeral right um and, right. but it's, it's hard to do the human nature stuff you know? right well <laughs> they're very made it look easy yeah they're ver and they're and most things like you see a stand-up now doing a great take on something about our behavior Chances are there was a version of it that Mark Twain <laughs> did. He really it, did. He kind of did it all. He did. All. He was also very annoyingly prolific in addition to everything yep. else. He was the Louis C.K. <laughs> he was of his time. But uh, but anyway, I, was, I spent a couple of years doing this stuff, and then um, you know I think for some reason I don't remember what led me to this, but there was um, there was some issue some issue about something about the TV industry um, that that was going on. I think, I, I can't remember what the, notion, what the notion was. I can't remember the piece, but it was something in the news about TV. And just on a lark, I just 
submitted a piece to the New York Times op-ed section about it. And it was, it was kind of a fake news piece. It was sort of like taking off on, uh, I, you know what I think it had to do? It, it had to do with one of the networks. Why I think it had to do with Fox wildly overpaying for some sporting event. And so I started making fun I of it. I remember them. that. It was yeah. the NFL, I think. Yeah, it was something like that. And so I had I just kind of built on that in a very kind of lampoony or oniony way and just, you know, took it to an, another absurd level. I can't remember what the jokes were, I'm sad, sad to say. Um, but I remember I wrote that and... and you know, it was really fun to do. It suddenly felt like more like being back at the Lampoon or more like being my daughter now, you know, just playing, playing, you know, you get, when you write for the op-ed section of the New York Times, I don't mean to bum people out who see that as a career destination, but you get a solid $150, $200, something like that. It's not a living wage. And but to know that you're doing something you really love doing. Like yeah, I will say I had a tremendous advantage and that I didn't have a financial wolf at the door. And so right. suddenly, you know, suddenly it was like, okay, I've done, a, I've worked for 15 years doing a lot of stuff I didn't really like, but I made a lot of money at that. Is there something I can do with my life besides just making more money? Um, which is a very un-American thing to say. And I still, people still act like it's the most shocking thing that you would ever turn down a check to do anything. Because right. in America, we don't do that. But we I don't- live for money. But I actually think I am, I think it's the only rational decision you could make. It's like if you made money, like why not try something? You know, we do, we do not have a very long time on this planet. I hate to bring, bring down all the listeners now by reminding them that they're going to die. But I do think about that quite a bit. And I think, um, you know, more recently, you know, I've had, you know, I had a near-death experience a few years ago and it reminded me actually of, once again, not that we need a reminder, it's like we really have to make the most of the time we've got. and. Not that my time in L.A. was a complete wasteland of, of, of torment. I, there were some good things about it. But um, I suddenly found myself in New York in this world where I could write prose pieces, submit them to the Times, or submit them to the New Yorker. I could get involved in storytelling, which I did with this organization, The Moth, which has become now this kind of national thing via the radio. And suddenly I found myself getting involved in a lot of stuff where there was no real commercial... Um, goal, at least for me. I mean, I know that Condé Nast believes that the New Yorker has a commercial goal, and they certainly do. But from my point of view as a contributor in those days, it was just pure It was just like, and it was like, man, I really felt like I'd hit bottom doing TV in terms of my enjoyment. It's That's like, so interesting. Most people would have a really hard time, I think, separating the money from the joy. Yeah. Well, economic success feels like happiness quite a bit. It's, it's a... It's, uh, it gets blurred. Yeah, it's it's a powerful like delusion, right? Of happiness. And in LA too, and I don't know if it's like this, you know, in other places. Probably is like this in Silicon Valley. But when you're good at something and you're economically rewarded, it also feels like love sometimes. Yeah, you know, because in this culture, that's how we show love and appreciation. I can't tell you how many people told me they loved me, not <laughs> not love my work or loved my. Ratings was just they right. agents love me, you know. They'll say, you know, NBC wants to work with you. They love you. Well, they, they don't love, love me. They they don't know me. Yeah, no, they really conflate. <laughs> and it's and it, and <laughs> it fucks people up because yep. you know they want. And I've seen people who, in my view, have really made it and could walk away and actually explore something else. Not even necessarily writing, but you know, or cooking, or cooking anything, <laughs> anything in in life that would be more enjoyable. But they're also addicted to the faux love element of it yeah. all, the, the affirmation. Yeah. And um, I now, of course, am sounding like a total Zen master and actually sort of an asshole because I'm acting morally superior to everybody else. But these lessons have taken me a really long time to get to. I'm now acting like I knew it all. Yeah. It was, it's very, this stuff is so seductive. One of my favorite writers and, and just favorite people that I've met since I've been in New York is is Calvin Trillin, who writes for The New Yorker, and is a great comedy writer, but also great storyteller and a great reporter journalist. He's sort of the, he's another one of these kind of Mark Twain-like figures who's a little bit intimidating because of how many things he's good at. And, you know, Bud, as he, he's known, he does, no one calls him Calvin, that's his 
and his, I think he said his father named him that because he thought that that was what somebody who went to Yale would be named. And he he had you know fulfilled that manifest destiny and eventually going to Yale. So I guess it worked. Sure. But Bud said that his wife, his late wife Alice, used to say this thing, um, which which I think has a tremendous amount of wisdom, especially for people like them who lived in New York and people like me who who live, live in New York now. She said a lot of people um, lack the ability, lack a sense of enoughness. That was the word that she used. And, that, and that's kind of a brilliant thing to say, which is that I'm often talking to people, even in the arts, who have a really good thing going, like maybe some little show somewhere or whatever, and the goal is always... Uh, well, how can we make this bigger? How can we move it? How can we turn this into an app? You know, how can we do something with it? And I understand why corporations feel that way because they are these monsters who are in. That's their reason for existing. How can we leverage this? Exactly. And um, you know what's what's weird, and it shows how life kind of, you know, the unpredictability of all of this is that when I was doing these little things for the New Yorker and for you know various you know the Times, the L.A. Times, these little kind of one-off um, humor pieces. I started writing, really just for my friends, I started writing m my fake news stuff, which is called The Borowitz Report, and I was, it was really just initially me just annoying like 200 people on my email list. And you just emailed so, them out. I'd email them out. But, you know, to me, that was like the purest example of my just fucking around because there it wasn't even I was operating on a loss because it was like I set up this website which actually cost you know a few hundred dollars to do but there was absolutely no commercial benefit to any of this and I was relentless about it. like I w this because I had more fun doing this than I had doing any of the things that I was getting paid to do right. and I would do it like five times a week some insane pace that I would never do now in my in my dotage um, but it was that was a case where something, I remember my agent at the time, who's still my agent, said to me, um, yeah, this stuff, you know, people really are enjoying these pieces you're writing. How can we monetize this? Yeah. <laughs> it was a natural question. Of course. And my attitude was like, I really felt, I, I mean, I, again, don't mean to sound like I'm a Zen master, but I kind of like said, like, you know, I did do something in the business world for like 15 years. Do I have to not, can I not monetize this? I was really trying to do things like the moth and like this dumb website that were, if anything, money losers or just felt like volunteer work. Like right. I just, it was such a, and maybe I was being a little extreme and babyish, but it was a complete reaction to a, having been at NBC and in, you know, at this very high pressure um, sort of paragon of capitalism. I was just, it was just, you know, being very oppositional about all of that. Let me ask you about the agent. This is an agent that you had when you were in Hollywood working. No, it was actually a literary agent. A literary here. agent. Yeah. So it's somebody that you got after you yeah. in Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just wondering why you would need an agent. Uh, I guess a literary agent is makes sense because you do write a book on occasion. Yeah, although, you know, again, that was something I sort of fell into. What happened was I wrote an article for The New Yorker one of the first articles I wrote was like a parody. This is really going to date the article. And an example of things that are no longer funny. Uh, it was it was an article about day trading, and which was like in the dot com boom of the late '90s was yeah, the thing. That was the thing. It was the most insane kind of gambling, legalized gambling, crazy. And, and crazy, and everybody lost a lot of money. So what happened was um, I wrote this, you know. 800 word shouts and murmurs uh, thing, which was like a guide to day trading, it was like full of like the worst advice, but it actually was very close to the actual advice that day traders would use, like, you know, never own a company long enough to find out what the company does, things like that. And, and it was stuff that was actually pretty similar to real advice, but just maybe one inch over. And a book packager came to me and said, I think we can monetize this. It was like, I think this could be a really funny book. And I was like, really? I said, I feel like I said <laughs> everything <laughs> that had to be said. And he said, no, 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 I really think we could sell this. And I said, it, would only, it wouldn't have to be like a book book. It could be 10,000 words. Like, you know, you can make it like just a kind of a novelty book and we get out fast. And I thought, well, I don't know, 10,000 words, that doesn't sound so bad. So we actually went out and sold it. And the first thing they said was, okay, so it has to be 20,000 words. <laughs> so alre already there's that slippery slope of <laughs> yep. commerce. but. The book, which um, you know, I, I enjoyed doing, I think was released maybe a week 
after the stock market crash so that the whole idea of day trading was now not only not funny but maybe like the thing that nobody ever wanted to think about ever again so kind of doomed the commercial prospects of that book but what came out of it was that now i had a book agent and the book agent actually recommended me to um a, a speakers bureau and so i sort of it was actually kind of good for me and, and it sort of helped me into this next phase of my life where i was getting back to doing more performing and doing more public speaking, got back into stand-up, storytelling with the moth. I was really having a lot of fun. So that was an avenue that you pursued um, and got really good at. How do you compare that to writing comedy? It's I think of it as a totally different beast. Mm -hmm. um, is it in the same universe for you or is it uh, different? Are you winging it most of the time or are you writing prepared bits when you go on stage? You know, I am more of a winging it performer. I think you know, I have real limitations, um, as I said, as I alluded to earlier, I have real limitations as an actor. And I think like the great sort of stand-ups are people who create a character that's not entirely themselves. It's this distance, this veneer, this lack of awareness. Right. Well, which Mark Twain was great at. Right. You know, writing in character so that you can sense the intelligence behind it. Right. Adds such a great layer to the comedy. Right. But you don't do that. You're up there as Andy Borowitz. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I think I've had, when it's gone well, it's been me being pretty unvarnished and kind of just, you know, you know, telling. And I think with The Moth, you know, the to me, the premium was always on not being a performer totally honest you know just straight. telling just um, i think i'm more of a talker than a comedian or a stand-up like i'm I, I can talk with an audience to an audience but i don't i can't talk like I, I can't have a prepared set of like a 90 minute set where i've like you know i, I mean I, I admire these people who are like really polished comedians because i think that's more like acting it's like where they've they've come up with a character they're playing a character that's like themselves or maybe not like themselves depending on who the person is sure and then they've honed this thing to this high sheen and then they're out there delivering it again and they can do 30 cities and they can kill everywhere because it's just like a freight train i did a little bit of that sort of thing when i was doing um when i had you know as i was touring the country doing a lot of corporate events and i had a kind of a set thing and it it got it got to work very well. I mean, I got to rehearse and I got to figure out what are the bits that work in what regardless of what city I'm in and and it was kind of a very um, it was it became a very polished comedy presentation. But again, sort of like the experience with Hollywood, I kind of shrank from that because it was just I I remember being on stage and there could be like a ten minute stretch where. It was almost like I was watching myself doing this. Like I had it down to such, you know, every beat was so rehearsed. I could be thinking like, okay, now afterwards I'm going to get my car and I'm going to like, where am I going to eat tonight? And I could really actually not be completely engaged because it was like, you know, doing the Broadway production of Cats for the thousandth performance. Right. Well, a lot of performers like getting to that place. It's like yeah, well, it's out of body, in the zone, but you didn't like it. I liked it up to a point. I liked the feeling... When it finally, you know, because when you're first starting as a stand-up, you're terrible. I don't care who who you are, how young you are, when you hit your moment of genius. It takes a while to get the material. And that's arduous, because that's failure, and you have to try and try and try. And so there's that moment, you know, that steep learning curve, and then there's that moment where, oh, like, okay, I've got like a half an hour now that really works, and this can work kind of no matter where I do it. And there's that feeling of, like, with a any job you do you always feel good when you feel like you can do it well now like especially if you've been crappy at it before there's that moment of like okay this thing that i was so bad at three years ago I now actually i can i can kill yeah, at this you can be proud of that yeah you can be proud of that so but again you know not to be perverse about this there's a difference between being good at something or having mastery of something and enjoying it <laughs> you Big keep difference. bringing that up yeah but i sort of felt like um you know I liked that I, I really had more fun when I, I li had more, if I had to compare performing when I perform and do like a, a half hour of stand up someplace that was very rehearsed and and routine or I would be at the New York Poetry Cafe in New York hosting a moth slam where people were getting up and 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 telling stories 
and I was improving the whole night and just interacting with the audience, interacting with the other storytellers, there was no comparison. That's what I loved. And I loved the lack of preparation. And I loved that moment of discovery of like, oh, we're, we, we're in a rich vein here and I can kind of play with this for a while. The improv that you do, you know, you're making it up on the spot, but your your timing is just is perfect. You're just hitting audience buttons just perfectly. Oh, thank, when thanks. You're, you're being very kind to me today. So I'm just going to listen to this podcast whenever I'm feeling suicidal. Uh, it'll really help. No, I'll, I'll be unkind <laughs> later. But and I'm wondering if that's something that you developed in doing the hard work of learning stand-up. You know, I think that, um, I think it's, I think you have to have some ability some natural ability to like sort of hear or feel what's going on in a room. Um, and that's kind of probably not everybody likes that. Probably there's some people who would rather sort of have the safety net of jokes they know work, um, which I don't, I don't blame them because it's, it's scary to be up on that stage and not have anything work. That's kind of a, a nightmare <laughs> for yeah. every performer. So there's probably a little bit of, of, of aptitude for that, that I've got. But I think that, I think that it's a lot of it is learning by doing. Like I think that you, you figure out. It's like any kind of any any kind of skill. You just the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with um, letting things breathe. Like you know, waiting. Like getting a sense that a joke has some room. Like there's there's room for them to laugh more at that joke. And if you milking that for every second. Yeah, certain things also. It's like just learning. Um, I think I'm blessed with kind of a funny face. <laughs> I think that I, I you look, just have a very unusual look. <laughs> I, have an, I, I have a funny face in my view, but I think I remember my son saying my who's now 20, but I remember when he was around nine, eight or nine saying, um, saying that he thought I looked really funny when I was serious. And he said, he said, I like your serious face. He said, it's a funny face. And he was actually very astute because that is my funny face. My funny face is a very serious face where I'm actually showing almost no expression whatsoever. That's right. And it works. I've learned over time that I have to use my natural g gift of funny looking, um, of funny looks. <laughs> and Which takes a lot of self knowledge. And well, yeah, but I mean, it's like you know, this is the way. This is the way I was put together. And you that, don't care if you're not taken seriously as who oh, you are. Like no, I do not care. I, you know, I've never really understood. I understand why people were good at being, I understand why Dostoevsky wanted to be taken seriously because he was good at that. Uh -huh. I am not, um, I've never wanted to be taken seriously. I've never, I think some of that is also, you know, comes down to birth order. You know, I was the littlest kid in my family. I was very much overlooked. And I think, and when talking to comedians, a lot of times comedians or people in comedy are the youngest because the youngest is naturally teased and not taken seriously and vying for attention and vying for attention totally lost and it's like well if your route to getting attention is being taken seriously that probably is being taken up by the oldest in the family because that is the receptacle for all the family's hopes and dreams for the future. There's really none left. There's nothing. For you at My all. parents had no parental they don't juice. Even, they, they lose the school pictures. Yeah, uh, there were no you're pictures of me. an afterthought. There, there are no, know, yeah, there, there, are no there, pictures. there are like eight year gaps in my childhood where it looks like maybe I was, you know, abducted by another family or something. There are no, like you go through the family albums and I mean, I'm not self pity. I'm just saying like, there's me at seven on my Stingray bike. And there's me graduating from high school. What happened in those intervening 11 years, well, no one knows. It's so curious to me <clears throat> why you wouldn't yearn then to be taken seriously. But for some reason, that's a groove that you can get into that's comforting. Right. To not be taken seriously. I think I was always sort of just the little kid, the cute little kid who would get up and do something hammy at a family reunion. And that when you get those laughs early on, that becomes very addictive. So it was a happy family. It was a uh, um, nice childhood. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would say it was. What's that line about? You know, every unhappy family is unhappy differently. I mean, I I think there were some things about. It was mixed, like every childhood. I mean, I I you know I think that I was neglected to a great extent. I was an afterthought, being the youngest. What I remember about my childhood is a lot of loneliness and a lot of being alone, but. Being alone 
is really good preparation for being a writer because um, I spent hours, I was writing these seemingly endless, and now if you look back at them, they are endless detective novels, like spoof detective novels. It's like so when great I, that you've kept those. Yeah, there's a little somewhere. I, 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 I'm, I'm nervous to crack the moment, although I think they would make me laugh now for, for a different reason. Yeah. But um, I was just in my room writing and writing and writing and writing. And it was, there's a great Ray Bradbury quote, which I'm sure I'm mangling. Um, and I, if, I'm probably getting it the wrong way, way around, but he said, um, to fantasize is to survive. Um, or to survive is to fantasize it's one way or the other. And his view of his, you know, his work was that creating this alternate universe is a survival strategy. Well, it's like uh, the kid in play and imagination. Yeah, it? and you know, we can fret about our writing and our creative stuff, but when it's actually when we're in it and it's enjoyable, you everything else disappears. It's yeah. like a drug, and everything else vanishes ar around us. And it may not even look, what comes out of it may not even be something that's that great or that other people even get. But in the moment of creation, it is like um, a sort of a transporting experience. And so I was like up in my room writing stuff. I was drawing comic books. I'm not a great artist, but I, you know, I love comics. And I was like drawing like spoofy comic books. They're funny. Okay. No, yeah. Not superhero. Yeah. Well, they series. were superheroes, but they were like, they were silly, silly. it was like Futility Man was like one of the guys and he was like just couldn't do anything right and so it was all i had this very kind of spoofy sensibility i was never trying to do anything serious and then i made su these super eight movies and i remember just being you know i had like super eight movies were you know such a kind of archaic technology i don't know if you ever made them when I you did, were little, I loved but i mean splicing the film together and having like i had a little you know editing machine with a As viewer I. <laughs> yeah. and i again like editing and I found this later in Hollywood. One of the things I really enjoyed about doing TV, I didn't so much enjoy being on the set and collaborating with everybody. It's the post-production. Yeah, post. It's like you're in a little dark room and it's like you and one other person and you're saying, let's try that again and let's add two frames. I could do post-production like for 14 hours and never lose interest there's in it. There's comfy leather couches, yes. a bowl of there's beverages. Yeah, there's a fridge. Unbelievable. That's why I like doing animated cartoons because it's yeah. all post-production. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah, and I think it's... There's a reason why somebody with a writing sensibility likes post because it's total solitary, control. Yeah. total control, yeah. no other people. <laughs> exactly. It's it's if only the world worked that way. Yeah, so I mean in terms of like I guess I'm not the cliche of like oh, you know I got into comedy cuz I had a miserable childhood. But there were certain things about my childhood that impelled me into becoming a writer and and because I always think like the person who has a kind of a happy childhood and is like really good at sports and really good looking and stuff. They have so many other options of what they can do. Um, even for me, it's like I sucked at sports. I was funny looking, and and I was alone. So like, there's a very short list of what you're going to do with that. <laughs> right. So let's jump back to um, the Borowitz report. Okay. When Twitter comes along, you sort of make the transition from doing an email list to a Twitter feed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the website it carries through both. But around that time, the, the larger Onion staff discovers the Borowitz report mm -hmm. and immediately hates it <laughs> because it's like, hey, wait a minute, How, this guy's doing the Onion <laughs> and he's, he's getting really popular doing it. Uh, did, did you ever get any uh, flack for doing something that was so much like the Onion uh, and succeeding? Sure. I mean, I think, but I think, you know, let me, let me first clarify that. I like to... Um, I, n I always have gotten flack. For, for whatever. For whatever. For any reason. I, I mean, I remember in college, well, in college, like I, when I was doing, I was one of these annoying guys who was doing everything. Was, you know, trying to do everything, doing, you know, performing and shows and everything. And and I remember, I, I've shown this to my wife and we laugh about it, but the um, Harvard Crimson actually did a story. This wasn't an editorial, it was a news story. And, and it was when I won the competition for the Hasty Pudding show, my script was selected. And the headline was, putting competition under fire. <laughs> and the article was just about people being angry with me that I'd won the pudding competition. And that actually really, to me, um, I started at Harvard getting really inoculated to the notion of pissing people off for whatever I was doing. Because, you know, especially 
people really are pissed off at you when you do something and it succeeds because if you do something and it fails, you go away and you disappear and everyone's right. happy. So, you know, in a way, like, like no one likes it when people are mad at them. We all like to be loved. And, and I actually, you know, you know, we, we've been friends for a long time and I, a lot of the onion writers over the years I've been friends with and we've peacefully coexisted, but you know what my, you know, my view of this has always been that fake news is has been gone, going on much longer than either of us. I mean, you know, it was when I got to the Lampoon, the Harvard Lampoon, it had already been going on for decades at the Harvard Lampoon. And then the National Lampoon started doing it, and then The Onion did it. Um, and The Onion bred many, many imitators, and still does. I mean, every, but I feel even like the mainstream news, I don't know if you feel this way, but like a lot of times I feel like if you go on Google News, people are writing headlines, sort of in onion form, um, that are that are like real headlines. I mean, but they're the phrasing seems an awful lot like an onion headline to me. Yeah, um, no, they're trying to inject humor right into the headlines in a way that they they didn't before. But I see such a convergence there because before that, I think Spy Magazine had a much bigger impact on the sort of tone yes. of mainstream media yes. writing. Yes, Kurt Anderson. And great. everybody trying to be cute and Ryan smart snarky. alecky and snarky. But they, right. they did snark better than anyone. And that, again, Spot. more lampoon people. Kurt yeah. Anderson. You yeah. know, so, this, so it's all coming from the same place. Exactly. I guess my, my response to all of that would be um, I admire The Onion so much, as you know. And, it's kind um, of you to say. So if I've in any way annoyed people at The Onion by doing The Onion... I am very grateful. <laughs> I'm very grateful that I've, I've even approached that, you know, approached the turf that much that it would even annoy anybody. I, I actually think, I don't like to split hairs, but I think like there's some stories that The Onion does, um, or that I do that could have been in either one. And then, but then there's all kinds of stuff that The Onion does that I could never do, partially because I wouldn't be good at it. What The Onion's always been great at doing for me, and it's so different from what I do, is great at taking the minuscule sort of everyday life and it's really very much like almost like observational stand-up it's like taking that moment of like you know man proud of thing he ordered you know whatever area and, man. yeah area man taking the very minute thing and blowing it up into um into prominence and i i think that's like a gift that if i tried that i would fail dismally i just don't think i have that i think i'm i'm more interested my focus is a lot narrower than the onions which is that i'm really interested um kind of you know there's a difference between fake news and satire um and i think the onion does both really well like i mean i think like fake news and that sort of observation of like the you know, the absurdities of human nature, which is almost like a Mark Twain thing, which The Onion completely nails. Um, I'm sort of not even in that in that ballpark. Like, I, I am looking at sort of the largest follies and the, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest hypocrisies that are sort of institutional. Hypocrisy. And it's a very narrow, it's a very narrow beat that I've got. And it's like every now, I mean, you know, I very rarely, and I don't even, you know, when I th sit down to think of things, I'm never even thinking outside of that. I'm thinking of like, okay, who are the biggest liars, hypocrites, most disingenuous people, and people who affect, hopefully, millions of people's lives? Because I kind of, I sort of see that, I don't have a serious mission, but I sort of feel like in satire, which is what I'm trying to do, I want to come up with worthy targets. And so I'm all, always trying to think of like somebody who's really fucking things up for everybody else. I don't want to sound too like crusadery or like I'm messianic. But that or is your beat. That's it, my beat. It is different. It's very limited. Yeah, it's very like limited. The onion is, is probably going after more human foibles that we all share, whereas right. you're really going after the maybe a big political target or something like that. Right. But I'll tell you, there was a period when I was editing The Onion in the mid 2000s when we had to check your website. <laughs> every week before we went to press to make sure we didn't have the same joke. Right, I do that. there was a lot of like-mindedness going well, on Well, especially there. the Bush years, yeah. I yeah, mean, because yeah. it's like there, and there is a certain, you know, I mean, I'm, I always do that routinely with The Onion, especially if there's like a big story like, you know, Tom Brady or something. I want to make sure that it's like, this isn't the thing that The Onion guys thought of. And, and it will piss me off 
in, in a big way when the onion nails something in a way I could never do in a million years. And I just tip my hat to you. I mean, <laughs> and I to you because we there were a couple of times when we had a story we were really excited about, and you had done it. Yeah, you know, because you were way ahead of us in terms of the twenty four hour news cycle. You were responding to news events in a way like the Daily Show. And we didn't start doing that until about 2012. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, we were just doing evergreen stuff that seemed newsy. Right. But we weren't necessarily responding to news. And occasionally we would. And that's when, you know, we would have to go back over two weeks of your daily story. Just to see if I Just to see if you had done the same thing. And typically you would at least gone to that subject. Right. So I think that's where a lot of that, like... That Andy Morowitz <laughs> well, came I, from, and it just—it was—it really—it was ingrained in, in the in the staff culture for a long time. Like, sort of Andy Borowitz is our nemesis. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> which is so funny because you're you know you're just the nicest guy in the world, and like you said, you've led a very uncontroversial life. You're just trying to make funny stuff, but like with that article at Harvard, it's like yeah. you've achieved such success with it. I think inevitably you get to a certain perch and people are going to try to knock you down. I saw an article recently, I forget where it was, it was like Split Sider, one of those websites, that was all about how Andy Borowitz is not doing satire. I see. Do you know that article? No, I don't. I'm glad you don't go to I do not go. We know what I do. But it was like really this really anti uh, Andy Borowitz article about how the work you do uh, doesn't count as serious satire. And it was just kind of mean. Well, you know, I. It's funny, like, I do not, this is why I do not Google myself. But thanks for pointing that out to me. Regardless. I'm sorry. No, 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 you, no. you didn't ruin my day. You know, it's funny, like, Sarah Silverman once said, which I thought was really wise, like, you know, I have no idea whether Sarah ever Googles herself or what, but she said that you have to realize something. You're the only person Googling you. And that was, I thought, very wise. And yeah. so, like, you know, what we do as writers or as creative people requires a tremendous suspension of of anxiety and doubt. We have to convince ourselves somehow that what we're doing has some shred of value and that somebody will like it. So in order to do that, you have two options. One is you can spend all day looking at all the people telling you you suck, or you can try to create you know, the atmosphere that Jimmy Fallon's parents created for him and create a faux sense of confidence that hey, somebody's going to like this. Or have the attitude of comedy is a game of averages. Yes. And if you're satisfying more than 50% of the audience, that's a pretty good laugh in in a room. Who cares if the other 50% don't like you or even hate you like they're right. not your audience you know they're well, not kinda, everybody's gonna love what you do i mean this sounds like a rationalization but i actually think and i th- i think other people would probably agree with me the joke that everybody in the world thinks is funny is probably not a very good joke like the odds of a joke being there that everybody can kind of get and equally enjoy is what would that joke even be that 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 you're doing something that some people think is funny and some people think is terminally unfunny. I'm cool with that because that you know, you you can't you're not going to thrive in comedy very long if nobody thinks you're funny. You've got to find an audience of people who like you. But by doing that, you're going to have to be somewhat mainstream enough that you're going to piss off the real nerds. The nerds. Well, I, so it's yeah. a balance, you know. Yeah, you really do I, have to find that. Balance. And I never. I mean, I, I respect people who study comedy in that kind of nerdy way and who are very into ranking comedians and ranking comedy and saying this is good and that is good and that's this is good and that's bad. I think as you get older and I cop to being an old guy, I think you see a little more nuance in a lot of this stuff. And like there are people, you know, when we were at the Lampoon in our 20s or teens, we were so judgmental of everything. And there were people who were terrible and people who were hacky and corny and everything. And now, like, you know, 30 years later, you you see that, well, it's kind of, comedy is kind of like a big tent. And it's like, why would you, you know, the only thing that is true, that's a true statement, is I do not find this particular thing funny. That is a true statement because that is true to me. Right. Um, but to make declarative statements about, this is not funny. <laughs> or he is not <laughs> He is funny. not funny. I find that really entertaining. It's that, that shows a certain um, um, belief in one's own authority that I certainly don't have. Like, I think I, there are a lot of people out there who like, you know, TV shows that I know are super popular and they don't appeal to me. But I would never say they're not funny. I would just say 
not funny to me, or I don't think it's right. funny. But, but like you said, when we were 18 or whatever, we all had that brashness. Right. And now all those people are online. They are. Can write any attacking they me want. simultaneously. <laughs> but also, the other thing that I know as a, somebody who writes online is that there's more of an upside in attacking something than there is in sort of offering a moderate, nuanced opinion. Especially so I, now with clickbaiting. Yeah. Like that's going to get. The, the attention. Yeah, so I don't, you know, I, I take that for what it is. But, but honestly, to, to be totally honest with you about this stuff, like in any endeavor, especially something artistic, if you would have to be made of really stern stuff to like spend all of your time like absorbing all the, you know, criticism of you and then still pull it all together and then go out and play another day, it's like, it's like playing for the Yankees in New York. There's some people who come here and they just crumble because you know they can't stand the articles in the New York Post about them. If you want to do something and put your chin out there and and like try to make people laugh, or or any kind of writing or any kind of art, you've got to. This is just part of the part of the game. Let's talk about the transition from Twitter to the New Yorker, which you know is again one of these sweet deals, mm -hmm. which is a prose comedy writer's dream job, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So what's that experience been like? Well, it's been interesting. I mean, I think that it, you know, you know, I think it did probably brought with it, you know, more scrutiny because again, like putting comp under fire, you know, it's like a good thing happened to somebody. That's always bad news for somebody's going to really somebody's going to hate, gonna hate, hate for that. even more for that. So, but just putting the I, you know, I knew I would, would take a certain number of hits for that, and I've, you know, I I really try to kind of put myself in a silo and make myself um, isolate uh, isolate myself from that stuff. But actually, from a creative point of view, um, it's been beneficial, and I think it's because when I was doing doing stuff on my own. I had done this site for about 12 years and it was kind of like if you do any job for 12 years, it was kind of getting to be the same process all the time. You know, not that the stories were all the same, although a lot of them, like as you know at The Onion, you are doing certain themes and tropes over and over again. Sure. Um, but I think it was actually, it was a good time for me to have a little bit of a different change of scene and a, and new people to deal with. I think that being an, a naturally solitary person, it's sort of nice having a little bit of interaction with an editor over there, like Nick Thompson, who edits the, the website, um, is a really good guy and a really smart guy. And he is really good when I submit something um, to the website. He's, re he's really good if he, if he flags something that he thinks could be improved. He, he always is very constructive. So you don't feel that's an imposition on the former creative freedom that you had? No, because honestly, sometimes I feel like when a creative freedom could sometimes be another way of saying slipshodness, which is sure. that, you know, you just like, oh, I'm, a, I'm like a maverick. So I'm just, you know, putting this out there without really right. thinking it through. So it's you're and, collaborating. Yeah, it's a little bit of a collaboration, but it's not, again, it's not like Hollywood where I'm in a room with 30 people like it's still one guy you know I'm still one guy in a room alone cooking it up and then you know it's nice um, the other thing the New Yorker brings and, and the onion certainly benefits from this is really high quality art art photographs I was always when I was doing my own website I was just pulling shit off of Google sure. Google images yeah. and they have such brilliant photo editors in the New Yorker so like they will have a there's something about a fake news story that's accompanied by a really legitimate looking photo that's so much better and Makes funnier. Makes a huge difference in the, just the verisimilitude. In that. Yeah, and I, I also, um, it's been really a totally, I, I wish I could think of like what the negative has been. I mean, I think the only negative probably was at the outset feeling a little more pressure, um, just like the New Yorker made a huge commitment and it was kind of sticking there. They had never done this before. It was like yeah. sort of sticking their neck out. It was very unusual deal. It was an unusual deal. And I sort of didn't want to let them down. And I also like, there was. there's always that chance when you come out with anything. It's like, okay, you know, you put it up there and then no one reads it or no one likes it. And it was like, so the, the challenge of like, would my audience, which at that time was was healthy, would they, you know, make the move to like the New Yorker website with the New Yorker, readers i mean fortunately i had already been writing for the new yorker for right. 14 years so like i wasn't like a new totally new 
it wasn't like they were they were bringing in somebody that that people had never heard of. Does it feel like a job now? Or? It doesn't feel like a job, but it it definitely I feel like I don't I feel like I want to I do want to deliver for them because I feel like they made a commitment and and it's do you have not a, it's, uh, like fine print in your deal that says if it ever does feel like a job, <laughs> I can get out. Well, we you know it's it's funny when we originally made the deal to do it. The one person I consulted with about this was um, was Nate Silver because Nate Silver had had his very successful blog, and Sim- the New York Times. New York Times yeah. And so I don't I didn't know him, but I just wrote to him out of the blue and I said, um, "How did you make your deal?" And he gave me um, sort of the contours of it and, and basically enabled, you know, it, it, it. I think he was there for three years and then they parted company. Hmm. Um, so ultimately, each each side decided they were better off doing it a different way. But I think his his vision was that you know while you're you know basically he said while you're there, uh, while he's at was at the New York Times, he understood that it was the New York Times as a newspaper and it's their game. It's their yeah. you know you're working for them. Yeah. Um, but he wanted to leave himself the you know the opportunity to if it didn't work out for them to walk away, and that's ultimately what happened with him. So it wasn't like we signed a life like I wasn't signing my life away it was like everything was going to be short term enough that if they were unhappy with me or or vice versa that we could you know move on and well, it was wise yeah it was and i you know in general i approach everything in life it's like everything's so temporary i mean we're we're very temporary <laughs> organisms i hate to keep bringing it back to mortality but um i do think about that quite a, a bit a big part of life it is a big part of life and um so look it's a great job you know right now this day and Hopefully it'll, you know, it'll be great going into the future. But you just never know. You don't, you know. I thought when I started in TV, you know, in 1980-81, I had the sensibility of like a lawyer's son. You know, my dad had worked in a law firm for 40 years, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to be like on a staff of a sitcom for the next 40 years. That's what I'm going to do. And my life took a very, very unpredictable series of turns. And so I think there are probably more turns ahead in, in you know, in the years ahead. And probably, it, that's your pattern. Who knows? Yeah, who knows where we'll be. Um, S- speaking of mortality being a big part of life, you mentioned your near-death experience, and you wrote, about, you wrote a, um, an Amazon uh, book about it. How did that experience affect your comedy, if at all? Well, you know, I... Yeah, I, w- I won't tell the, all, the whole story of what happened to me, but I had sort of a surgical mishap a couple of years that almost killed me. And um, I think it affected me in the sense that I had never really told a story that was personal, ever. I had always had a mask on. I was doing fake news. I was doing shouts and murmurs. I was doing all kinds of um, things that were in these forms that really hid your personality. Facts of life. Facts, <laughs> facts of life, where I was really speaking through Tootie and, yes. and Natalie. Um, but even, yeah, like Fresh Prince, you know, it's like, well, it's my sense of humor, but it's, you know, it's Will Smith and it's, you know, it's not, it's not me. Certainly not my experience. And this was really, I had told stories in The Moth, but I think all my stories were kind of on the lighter side and they were all, they weren't that personal because I just didn't have anything, you know, I had sadness in my life and there were things that I could have talked about, but I had never really, um, I think I'd always sh- shrunk away from that. And I think this time the stakes were so high and I st- was feeling it sort of so profoundly that some I, something in me just sort of said, well, fuck it, I'm just going to say what really happened. And and when, it, when I was going through that sort of surgical nightmare, um, I remember thinking of things that would make a good story, but all my thoughts about it were incredibly maudlin and trenchant and dramatic and bad. And it's really a case of that, you know, that old saw about, you know, comedy equals tragedy plus time. You know, it's just like within a couple months, I had found a different way to tell the story and it was 100% true, but it was funny. It was like, and it was just, and I didn't make up a single thing, everything that, that happened actually everything people said people actually said but um i think it was it was just a new experience because i sort of dropped the mask and it does make me think that you know at some point what i'm doing now is going to run its course um and maybe what i'm going to do next will be something that if i do more writing 
maybe it'll be a little bit more personal and maybe it'll be a little bit without the mask as much but i could i could be sitting here two years from now and saying ah that doesn't sound like a good idea <laughs> so who knows but yeah. it was it was that was a specific thing that happened to me that i felt was like worth telling because the stakes were so high you don't get better than life and death you know that's like yep. the best stakes in a story that's why third acts of movies have that you know all the time near death visit with death yeah, yeah visit with death so um <laughs> I don't really know that, I don't know that I have another story in me that is going to be as interesting as that. I hope I don't have too many more like that particular yeah. one because it wasn't fun to go through. Um, but it, it just, again, I think it was just kind of an interesting experience and in learning that you don't always have to like go for the joke. And you don't always have to have the mask on it, to be funny. You can, it's a very basic truth about comedy that, you know, honesty and what's real is, is going to, is going to work but then you have to find a way to you still have to find a way to make that funny and not just you know horrible which it right. could have been so, so it sounds like it opened you up to be a little more honest in your comedy yeah and be more comfortable with that but in a bigger way it's funny you didn't even mention this but early in life you had realized what you really wanted to do and you seem to be really in touch with that a lot of times people will have a near-death experience and and then realize that. And right. Say, oh my God, I should be doing something totally different. But you kept doing what you were doing. So you clearly had made the right choice before because when the chips were down, you were you were doing what you wanted to do. Right. That's true. I think the only thing that had changed for me a little bit, and I sometimes fall off the wagon a little bit with this, but I think it did make me take things that happened to me or happen sort of in the in in the career world, like the writing world much less seriously like but I think. you already didn't take them seriously so you're now at a you're at an incredibly <laughs> rare level of not taking things seriously. yeah well i mean i think that's i think that's true i but i think you know they're look everybody has their moments where their ego rises up and they suddenly think that whatever they're doing is but an incredible you, anymore. you're the zen master <laughs> no, no, no. no ego no 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 i have a tremendous it's 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 lurking there and it's always but it's such an enemy of of being happy that like you really have to like keep it in check it's just it's it's you ne you don't you don't get to the point where you're like doing stand up and making a spectacle of yourself if you don't want a lot of attention your ego doesn't need a lot of gratification so i'm very aware of that flaw in me as a person but i am also aware that there is nothing less important than what we are doing on this planet than everything we are doing. So let's, you know, it's like that old song, um, is that all there is? Well, yeah, that's all there is. So let's just try to have a good time and, and more entertainment and, and trying to, you know, like what we did back at the Lampoon or what you guys do at the Onion, like try to make each other laugh and, and have some fun because it is, it's a, the party is very, very brief. Well, Andy, it was very fun talking with you, so oh, thanks, thank you Scott. for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. If you liked it, please leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Reviews help get the word out, which will lead to more great shows. So everybody wins.